Great. Um, hi, everyone. And, and thanks. First, I'd like to thank the organizer for organizing this uh, very interesting uh, workshop conference. And uh, just one second, let me confirm. Yeah. OK, so, so today I'm going to talk about uh, bosonic quantum error correction and the various potential applications. So um, as we all know, like uh, actually bosonic systems play an important role in various quantum information tasks from computing, communication, metrology, and simulation. And one of the major challenges for bosonic, using bosonic system for quantum information processing is excitation loss. We know that uh, if we send a photon over like a fiber channel, at the end, it will be absorbed. So the information that's stored in these photons would be disappear. So therefore we would like to really maintain the information, especially the encoded quantum information, even in the presence of excitation loss. So how can we actually like uh, keep the quantum information intact while there's a uh, excitation loss? So before we look at that, let's maybe first look at how we do it for qubit systems if there is loss. So we actually introduce a quantum error correction formalism. And the essence of quantum error correction is to introduce redundancy so that you will have a larger Hilbert space and the encoded logical information and different logical states, they're kind of well separated in the logical Hilbert space, in the Hilbert space, so that if there's an error occurred, you will be able to detect and or even correct those errors because there's redundancy. If you only have two level systems, you need to introduce multiple copies of two level systems to have redundancy in order to do error correction. However, if, uh, however, if you have bosonic systems, actually, even with single harmonic oscillator, there are already many energy levels that already give you enough redundancy that actually allows you to do quantum error correction with even single bosonic modes. Moreover, the error pattern is actually very unique and in some sense is simpler for bosonic systems than qubit systems. For example, if you have photon loss, you'll find that every time if a loss error occurred, it will only reduce the excitation number by one which sort of enables the possibility of detecting or even correcting those loss errors by monitoring parity or photon number modulo some integer. If you have defacing, then the photon number don't change. And then typically for these bosonic errors, you will find that there is a locality in the phase space that sort of like a, the coherent state blob will only diffuse in this neighborhood so that you may take advantage of this locality that to achieve like a better error correction or even some biased error correction. That's as what Fernando Brandau talked about yesterday. So if we actually have a quite a bit of knowledge of these error models and we may potentially take advantage of it and get the best performance by carefully designing optimized quantum error correcting codes to correcting these bosonic loss errors. And it has been a few decades for people and like looking into bosonic quantum error correcting codes. For example, people, you can use like different FOX states, like zero or one with multiple modes to encode information, or you can use coherent state superpositions such as the CAT codes, as we'll talk a little bit later. Mm -hmm. And you can use higher photon number FOX states, like binomial codes and others that we'll talk about as well. Or you can use the position momentum as a complementary variables However, there's a way to get around it to simultaneously measure position momentum modulus some quantity, allow you to detect or even correct small displacement errors. And there are also hybrid bosonic and uh, discrete variable encoding schemes. And then today I'm going to focus in on how to use a single bosonic mode to correct loss errors. And in addition, if there's time, I'll also give an overview about like, how to use bosonic codes for various quantum information processing applications. So before we look into the bosonic, quantum bosonic codes, maybe it will be good to look how we actually use classical bosonic, uh, bosonic modes to encode classical information while correcting loss errors. And the uh, first example, which uh, I find is very intuitive and helpful, is to look into a classical coding scheme called phase shifted key. So we all know that for a coherent state, we can use the two real numbers to characterize. One is amplitude, the other is phase of a coherent state. And we know that in the presence of loss, 
The amplitude may change. However, the phase of the coherent state is still preserved. So therefore, if we store information in the phase of a coherent state, for example, here we have four possible coherent states with phase being zero, pi over two, pi and the three pi over two, then even though that it goes through a lossy channel, the amplitude may change, the phase information is still preserved. So therefore, if we use such a four coherent states, we can actually encode two classical bits of information as labeled in here. So this is actually a very successful encoding scheme, which is actually widely used in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So now the question is, can we, and also it uses just a single bosonic mode to encode the information. So the natural question is, can we extend such a technique to the quantum regime so that we can not only encode that this, uh, the classical bits, but also maintain the coherent superpositions of this encoded information. And just recall that, as I mentioned earlier, the key essence of error correction or even quantum error correction is to introduce redundancy so that you can not only detect or even correct errors. And here, we, if we think we have a four dimensional Hilbert space to start with, spanned by these four coherent states, then if there's a photon loss, we want to detect at least the presence of the, 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 the photon loss. Then one way to do it is to encode information in an even photon subspace. So we have four dimensional space and then we project out a subspace which has even number of photons, which will be actually a two dimensional subspace out of this four dimensional space. And here is actually a basis of this two dimensional subspace, which has even number of photons. For, our, for, for most of us who are familiar with quantum optics, it's basically, it's a symmetric superposition of coherent state alpha and minus alpha, which expanding the photon number basis, you will find that it only have even number of photon, or you can just based on the symmetry by performing 180 degree rotation in the phase space, you will find that actually it has even number of photon. It has its eigenvalue plus one under the parity. So it has even number of photon. And similarly, you can get another basis state, which is I alpha plus minus I alpha, which also gives you even number of photon basis states. And those two states are almost orthogonal uh, or exponentially close to orthogonal when alpha is large. So therefore, for typical values for alpha being like four, five, or six, it's already being a very, very good approximation being also normal basis. So this provides a logical basis so that we can encode the information in an even photon subspace of a single bosonic mode. And if there is a loss occurred, every single excitation loss will change the parity and we can monitor the parity to detect or even correct single photon loss errors. And here is an example that suppose we have these logical states, logical zero, logical one, which both have even number of photons and any superposition of such logical states start with even number of photons. If there is one excitation occurred, it will go to the odd photon space. If the two excitation, if another excitation loss occurred, it go back to even. And the third excitation loss will push it to odd and the fourth excitation loss and push it back to even. And you will notice that after four excitation loss, it goes back to the original state to start with. So there is a circle of life associated with this particular encoding. And you may notice that actually after two excitation loss, it go back to even space, which actually does have overlap with the state to start with. However, you may notice there's a relative phase of minus one between the two logical states. So if we misidentify the kind of, if we couldn't resolve individual photon loss, but only kind of measure parity, we might misidentify it. So it is misidentified and induced logical error. So it is crucial to identify and detect every single photon loss so that we'll be able to keep track of the photon number loss modulo four so that we know how we should interpret the encoded information in one of these four possible states. So the key property for the CAT code is that it can detect single excitation loss by measuring parity. And we only need to track single photon loss, the total number of photon loss modulo four, and we can, in principle, we should be able to uh, correct single photon loss, loss errors by carefully interpreting, like, okay, how, uh, by tracking the photon loss so that we know, like, okay, how to interpret the encoded information. Okay, so this is one example of a bosonic code, which has a connection with the classical coding of phase shifted key. And for, 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 for 
for some of us who likes like a really like I write everything in terms of photon number basis. And here is another example, which is called the kitten or binomial code. So this is actually very similar to cat code. The only difference is it has an exact photon number cutoff so that you don't write infinite number of terms in the FOC basis, but here you only need to write finite number of terms. So the logical zero state, you can think of that as a, a symmetric superposition of the vacuum and the four photon state. And logical one is a FOC state with two photons. And the key property is that both states have average of two photons. And you will find that actually any mixture superposition of those states will have always have average number of two photons. So that when, if you count the average number of photons, it actually doesn't tell you any information about the encoded logical information. Okay, so now let's take a look in how the code behave in the presence of excitation loss. So the logical zero, if you apply annihilation operator to it, the vacuum component will disappear and the four photon component will bring out a prefactor of square root of four, which divided by square root two, you actually get an extra square root of two times three photon. And if you start from the logical one state with two photon fox states, when you apply annihilation, it also brings up a prefactor of square root of two times one photon fox state. So first you find that you end up in the odd photon number space, which if you can measure parity, you can detect the presence of a single photon loss. In addition, the two prefactors are identical. So therefore, if we start with the superposition of logical zero and logical one, you will end up in a state which is also a superposition of, log uh, of photon number three and photon number one states with the same proportionality of these prefactors. So there is no distortion in this uh, one error loss and in this error space so that you can actually design a unitary to convert it back to the original logical space and restore the information, which is crucial. I'll put another way is that there's actually no back action, at least to the leading order in the presence of photon loss. So this enables us not only to detect single excitation loss by measuring parity, but also correct single photon loss errors. If one can design a unit to, to reverse this loss. Moreover, this the kitten code can be further generalized to something called a binomial code, which can correct multiple excitation loss errors. So basically you need to introduce more spacing between the photon numbers so that you can tolerate more loss without causing overlap between different loss errors of space. So the kitten code or binomial code is actually fully quantum because we write in the FOC basis and there is no simple analogy in terms of the coherent states. So that's the second example. And actually there is another third example, which is also very interesting, uh, which I think that uh, yesterday, like uh, Elena also mentioned, there's something called the quadrature amplitude modulation in the classical coding, which, um, which basically encodes information in both the amplitude and phase. And the, for this coding to work in the classical communication, you sort of need to know what is the loss rate so that you know like both how amplitude gets shrinked while phase being preserved. Or another way is you can think the position and the momentum, you sort of know there is a, a, a ratio of how it's changed so that you can still keep track of the information. So for example, if you use the 16 coherent states as labeled here, you can label these 16 states using four binary numbers so that you can encode four classical bits of information. And we can extend such a code to the quantum region, which is actually get to the famous goddess monkey type of press skill code which was invented about the early 2000s. And at that time, the key motivation is actually to correct added thermal noise to bosonic channels. And the essence is in like a, in the higher level of error question, you can think it as, okay, here you have a larger Hilbert space spanned by the coherent state. And I somehow carefully pick a superposition of different coherent states, which give me a two-dimensional subspace so that I can use that two-dimensional subspace to like encode the logical information while correcting loss uh, while correcting actually a random defacing error that was the original plan when they designed the code. How do we carefully choose the superposition of coherent states? And also how, what kind of coherent states we may want to use as a superposition to start with? And this is actually like some a very clever design and it was actually like based on uh, some very interesting simple facts of quantum mechanics. So first of all, in quantum mechanics, we know that the position momentum, they don't commute. So we cannot simultaneously measure position momentum because the commutators is not trivial. But it's a constant, which implies that if you make a closed loop in phase space, 
by displace the position, then displace momentum, then move the position backwards and move the momentum backwards, you actually get a non-trivial area in the phase space. And the wave function actually for arbitrary input state, the wave function will have an extra phase associated with this closed loop operation. And you can verify it by, like, by computing the operators, like uh, the, for displacement, you'll find it's actually proportional to a constant and there's a phase factor associated with the area. Now you may notice that the, the phase factor is actually an exponent, exponential. So basically if this area, which is uh, and associated with the phase factor is integer multiple of two pi, then this quantity becomes equal to one, which means that these four operations are effectively like moving along the position or moving along the momentum, they actually commute with each other. So for special choices of A and B, for example, here choose A equal to two times root pi and B equal to the same two times root pi, you enclose an area, which is four pi, definitely two times two pi. So therefore this enclosed area to be integer multiple of two pi, then you actually get two operators which commute with each other. So physically, when two operators commute with each other, it implies that probably you can simultaneously measure both operators. In addition, you can define the co-eigenstates of these two operators so that you can ham up with the states or a subspace, which are co-eigenstates of these operators with eigenvalue plus one, and that actually gives you a way to define a logical space to encode the information. And that's kind of like a, the stabilizer formalism in quantum error correction that people have defined like code states. And here we actually can borrow a similar formalism. So we had two operators which commute with each other, which associate with the displacement in position momentum by this uh, uh, two times root pi. Moreover, with these stabilizer operators, if we take a square root of them, we actually can come up with a logical operator because the logical x or logical z correspond to displacement in position momentum by square root of pi. And when you go a closed loop, you'll find that uh, they actually anti-commute. So that is exactly the algebra we want to encode a logical qubit. And this is also actually the well-known GKP code, which has a dimension two logical space encoding. The two is because the four pi is two times two pi. So therefore you can encode actually two, logic, uh, two dimension logical space for this code. And as I said earlier, that uh, the logical space is the eigenstate of these two stabilizers, which are associated with displacement in position momentum by square, two times square root of pi. And if you look at these logical code words, so logical zero, logical one, or logical plus or minus, you will find that they actually preserve this discrete translation invariant symmetry when you displace it along the position of momentum by two times square root of pi. And if you displace half of that, which is square root of pi, you will find that you go from logical zero to logical one. Or if you displace along the momentum direction, you go from logical plus to logical minus. So those are indeed, you can verify it as a logical operator that perform non-trivial operation in the encoded Hilbert space. And notice that actually like this code, because we can simultaneously measure kind of, you can interpret the stabilizers as simultaneously measure position momentum modulo, like square root of pi, so that uh, you will be able to actually correct the small displacement errors up to like this half lattice spacing. And uh, uh, furthermore, it doesn't have to be square lattice, it can be hexagonal lattice and you can encode information as well. Okay, so I talked a lot about the kind of different bosonic codes. I hope you get give a few idea about how these codes come from and the connection to classical coding. And the one way to characterize these codes is actually to plot the Wigner function associated with the projection operator to the logical space. For example, the four led cat, you actually see the projection to the logical space has these four extended legs. And there are some like a quantum part which has the Wigner function as some negativity. Indeed, it's indicating it's a quantum code. And similarly, binomial code, you can correct two photon loss extension. It has this nice pattern, which has a, uh, like a six-fold symmetry. And for GKP square lattice or GKP hexagonal lattice, you can have these patterns. So these projection of the Wigner function, uh, a projection operator that's showing the Wigner function has a unique fingerprint characterizing different codes. A natural question is, which is a better code in terms of correcting loss errors? Okay, so um, here we've, in order to compare these different codes, we need to have a performance metric which here we introduce something called the entanglement fidelity for comparison. 
So entanglement fidelity is sort of like a, uh, independent on what the initial state you put in, but it actually gives you a performance about like, okay, overall, it's kind of related to the average performance of a photon of a channel. Um, more, more rigorously, it basically put half of a bell pair and uh, do this uh, logical encoding and into the bosonic modes, let it go through a lossy channel and it let it recover with the best recovery you can do, get a logical qubit. And then you see, okay, finally, how good is this full bell pair survive through this channel with half of it going through this uh, loss, uh, lossy channel and error correction process. Okay. And in addition to make this uh, optimization controllable, we actually put a power constraint so that total photon number do not go to infinity, but uh, the average photon number gets bounded. So basically one can actually, first suppose you fix the encoding, you can actually use some efficient semi-definite program algorithm to optimize the recovery. And then you fix the recovery, you use semi-definite program to optimize the encoding. And you keep alternating the optimization of recovery and the encoding, and hopefully things will converge. And here is actually what numerically you find. Like start with some like random two-dimensional projection associated with the code space. After one round, it's kind of getting a little bit uh, condensed. And you will find that actually patterns start to emerge after about hundreds of rounds of iteration for optimization. And with more iterations, you'll find that actually a hexagonal lattice pattern start to appear. And this actually indicating that the hexagonal lattice GKP code is actually probably the optimum code for this one single mode for some encoding, at least with a performance metric of entanglement fidelity, it seems probably will be optimum. And it doesn't depend on what the initial state you're choosing, or initial projection you're choosing, it will converge to something like that. Up to some rotational symmetry, uh, you can, because you can assign arbitrary phase for your bosonic case. So we find that actually indeed you will be able to get a good code. And also the bosonic code can correct up to 10% loss uh, with restoring like 99.99% fidelity with this GKP encoding. So this is actually quite impressive and hopeful because we know that maybe with carefully designed optics, we can tolerate like a bosonic loss, maybe up to 10% and while restoring really high fidelity of encoding information. But the caveat so far is that we assume that the encoding and decoding are perfect. So therefore like it's also still something we need to take into account if there are the level of difficulty of doing encoding and decoding when we're choosing the optimum code. So in the presence, so one, one thing I'm add ask is that the GKP code originally was designed to correct uh, added thermal noise, right? Why it works so well for correcting loss errors, which, uh, which is a very different error model. The underlying reason that the GKP outperformed the other code is actually because it has, uh, there's a connection between loss errors and uh, added thermal noise. So if you have a coherent state as a loss, you can actually perform a phasing sensitive amplification and restore the original amplitude of the coherent state with added thermal noise. And because of this, you can actually effectively map a loss error channel with amplification, uh, using amplification, map it to a thermal noise channel with added random displacement. So that the GKP code is really good at in correcting such errors. And that's actually the underlying reason that GKP, even though originally was designed to correct a different error model, but can actually perform well to correct loss errors as well. Okay, so, so maybe um, I think I will just uh, give a brief example about like how we can actually use the uh, quantum error correction to correct uh, for cat codes. And uh, just recall that we can monitor the parity and we'll be able to track single photon loss error. And the key challenge is how do we perform quantum non-demolition measurement of parity without destroying the encoded state? We know in optics, typically we can perform uh, like a photon number counting, but here, we cannot do it because counting the photon number will destroy the entire state. We just need one classical bit of information associated with parity so that we will know how to encode, uh, how to, whether or not it's a photon loss without this perturbing the system too much. And the way to do it is actually to use a superconducting cavity qubit module. So if you have a superconducting cavity, here actually it's a, it's a three-dimensional luminal cavity, which there are two holes associated with the storage and the readout. And the information is really stored in the storage cavity. And there's a semi-transparent sapphire chip hosting a Josephson device, which is a transmount qubit. And the transmount qubit, you can treat it as two-level systems. 
And there, when the storage cavity and the transmog qubit, the energy, and they have actually, you can think about the JC model, they may virtually exchange excitations. But if you detune them by a lot, then the, the effective coupling is actually a dispersive coupling between the cavity and the two level transmog. And uh, the dispersive coupling strength can be over the megahertz, which is a thousand times larger than the loss of the cavity and the transmog. So therefore, you can think that uh, you can, the, the number of photons in the cavity start to shift to the energy level of the excited level of the two level system so that you can actually use the two level system to sense how many photons are there in the cavity. Okay, so a key point here is actually the reason we introduce this two level system to, to kind of uh, to probe the information about photon number is because we can actually use the quantum non demolition readout to read out the qubit information and it can be performed with single shot with high fidelity. And the idea is the following. Now we can start with a two level system preparing a symmetric superposition of ground and excited state. Let it evolve under this uh, dispersively coupled Hamiltonian, which is it's like a cross curve between the two modes. And let it evolve for a particular time, which is pi over chi. With this evolution time, every photon in the cavity will shift a pi phase of the excited state, will shift the phase by pi of the excited state. So if you have even number of photons, the total shift of the excited state will be two pi or integer multiple of two pi. If you have odd, odd number of photons, the shift in the excited states will be odd integer multiple of pi. So essentially it's a, like a, a change the relative phase between ground and excited states. So if you start from a symmetric superposition of ground and excited, it will become still symmetric superposition if there are even number of photons, and it will become anti-symmetric superposition if there are odd number of photons. And then you can do like another Hardman rotation and do the readout of the qubit and then figure out, get exactly one classical bit of information associated with the parity. And that is a, a quantum non demolition way of measuring photon number cavity without destroying the photon. So we can put all these together with a CAD code and the QND measurement of a photon number parity to track and repeatedly track the photon number parity so that we know how many photons have been lost during the process and then interpret the decoding. And here is the experimental data with the horizontal axis being time, vertical axis being the process fidelity. And to show that actually the boson encoding really works, we compare with the best like a uh, encoding without error correction for the last, the minimum photon number coding with zero and one is the best choice. If you do the cat code, you find that actually the loss increases because there are more photon in there, but it's a case without error correction yet. And once we restore the error correction, it actually can do better. So this kind of demonstrates that actually bosonic error correction can really boost the performance. Uh, and there are similar experiments with the bosonic code um, and the GKP code, as I mentioned earlier, and the people are working on it to improve the performance. So just at the higher level um, overview, that uh, we can have a discrete error correction. That's what I'm mostly talking about. And at the same time, there's also a continuous quantum error correction that allows you to like uh, stabilize the CAD code while also maintaining error bias. And uh, so for the sake of time, I'm not going to get too much into it as, and also Fernando also talked quite a bit about that. So maybe let me give a, uh, in the last two or three minutes, let me give a brief perspective about like how bosonic error question could be used for various applications. And I think in Fernando's talk, you already talked about, you can do it, use it for quantum computing with hardware efficiency. And we can also use it for quantum communication. For example, in one-way quantum repeaters, you can send the encoded information over lossy channel and at the repeater station, you, do, you can do error correction. And uh, you can use a more efficient bosonic coding to send information over bosonic cha a lossy channel. And then at the repeater stations, if needed, we can do frequency conversion from optical to microwave and take the full power of the superconducting technology to do bosonic error correction and then do frequency back. So there are lots of investigations about how to do microwave optical frequency conversion and, and the bosonic error question could be helpful to correct not only the fiber loss channel errors and also the conversion, there may be errors, added noise or loss errors and the bosonic error question could be helpful. And moreover, we'll find actually the bosonic encoding uh, and this time will be multi-mode encoding. It has the potential to achieve the channel capacity or at least asymptotically uh, approaching the scaling of channel capacity. And here is an example of a, like a, the multi-mode GKP code in the presence of loss error. 
and we we can show that at least the rate should be at least uh, uh, kind of like within like a 1.4 EBIT uh, between from the channel capacity you can achieve for the pure loss channel. So it does like have the potential to become a really good code for larger scale computing uh, communication. And the Bosani code could also be used for quantum metrology. For example, as I mentioned earlier, you can sort of simultaneously kind of measure position and momentum modulo some uh, static spacing. So that kind of be a, could provide a unique sensor that can simultaneously sense a small added noise in both position and momentum. And that would be advantageous for like a quantum sensing purposes. And uh, for like a simulation, you can actually get a very unique opportunity using boson encoding. For example, lots of people are interested in the boson sampling and the major challenge is photon loss that limits actually like how big as a system you can perform boson sampling. And however, there's actually a way that we can actually use bosonic coding to overcome the loss error and maybe encode a bosonic system into another multiple bosonic modes to do boson sampling. And we actually, first of all, there's a local theorem that you cannot use Gaussian encoding to correct loss error. So you need something non-Gaussian. And uh, for quantum optics, typically the non-Gaussian element, for example, is like uh, the Fox states, is a popular non-Gaussian ingredient. But this time I was proposed to add another non-Gaussian ingredient, which is the GKP state. It's also like, a, it's a superposition of coherent states and the wing the function is not Gaussian for sure. And that if we could use, provide the GKP state as ancillary, which actually could be used to sense the added thermal noise, then just recall if it is a loss with amplification, we can convert it to added thermal noise. Then we can use a GKP ancillary hybridized with our encoded bosonic information. And the encoding is simply a Gaussian operation, which consists of beam splitters and squeezers and phase shifters. We can actually perform a good encoding that can encode an oscillator into multiple oscillators. And the nice thing is that for, for boson sampling, the operations you perform is actually Gaussian operation. And the encoding is also Gaussian. So therefore, if you sandwich this logical operation you want to perform and with this for Gaussian operations encoding, you actually still get a Gaussian operation. So therefore, any like a logical level beam splitters can be implemented with just like a, a Gaussian operations at the physical level. So therefore, you can actually perform boson sampling at the logical level using this oscillator into oscillators encoding to perform like a sampling if you're really interested in. And we can also use the similar encoding for quantum metrology, communication, or the computing. So for the sake of time, I think I will stop here. Just like a key message is that actually there are various quantum information applications that you can use um, to like, a, uh, like a, as enhanced by bosonic quantum error correction. And at the end, I'd like to thank uh, all my group members and the collaborators, uh, both from theory and experiment, who actually enables this uh, like uh, program of research. And thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be happy to take questions. Okay, thanks a lot, Yang, for the nice talk and also for trying keeping the time. And now, questions? Okay. Hi, Liang. It's Matteo Rosati from Barcelona. Thanks for the great talk. I really enjoyed it a lot. Hi. I wanted to ask Thanks. a bit more of clarification on the, um, on the um, uh, parity uh, detection, because I didn't really get it, I think. So is it uh, you are correcting okay. and detecting parity at the logical level or really on the, on the coherent states? Uh, yes. So, so actually, the parity detection, the protocol, works for uh, like parity regardless whether you are in, uh, using coherent states or using other encoding. But it does give you like a one classical bit of information that whether or not there is a photon loss, there is a single photon loss. And uh, so, uh, so that, that could work for the binomial code, which is not a coherent state, right? And, uh, and the parity information, it just tells you about a kind of like error syndrome and it has no correlation with the encoded information. And um, I hope uh, if, um, that answers your question. Yeah, thanks a lot. So, um, yeah. Okay, yes, yeah. next question. Uh, so, Yang, uh, just a follow up. So, because I didn't get what is actually the mm -hmm. recovery operation you perform after the, the parity measurement? Ah. 
what is the actual recovery? I mean, practice, I mean, in optical yes. setup. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And uh, actually for, depends on different coding you do. For, for the cat code, actually like if the attenuation of coherent state is not too big, you basically just need to keep track of which subspace, uh, how you should interpret the encoded information um, by counting the photon number modulo four. And uh, for binomial code, as uh, you might recall, I, think we, I only explained it how the single photon loss and uh, the effect. But if they are, the next photon being lost, then actually we will not be able to recover the encoding information. So therefore, like uh, every once in a while, we need to make sure it push back to the logical space. And that's actually a non-trivial operation, which introduces additional error. And that's also the reason why actually the binomial code barely uh, haven't reached the break even yet. While the cat code you can because it's sort of a, a bit uh, trick that you can save that extra step. And uh, for, for the GKP code, uh, actually, it's even, in, even more interesting. You can think that actually you measure there's a way to do a weak measurement of the syndrome. And that in some sense are kind of effective in a stroboscopic way, kind of stabilize kind of like the system in this logical space. So for that case, you sort of also don't need to do like a very active recovery because this weak measurement sort of projected to there. And, uh, and uh, there will also be some back action. And uh, actually, if you look more carefully in Michelle's experiment, Michelle Devereux's experiment, you'll find that actually when do also need to occasionally put, make some displacement and to compensate the back action. So, so yeah, I would say like uh, uh, in, in general, one needs recovery. And, uh, but but uh, there are like uh, different levels of difficulty of how to do the recovery operation. Yeah, and uh, again, for the cat code, if you want to store it really for a long time, which may be 10 orders, uh, another order magnitude longer than this, one do need to kind of like uh, amplify the cat a bit. And there exists a unitary design, a unitary operation to achieve that. Okay, thanks so much. Okay. Are there any yeah, other you're questions? Welcome. Yeah, it seems no. So let's thank the speaker again.